The first Delta Wing supersonic all-weather F-102A interceptor to be delivered to a United States Air Force squadron rolled out of its hangar at Palmdale, California, May 1st, 1956. This is number one of scheduled deliveries to the 327th Interceptor Squadron. Not every Century Series jet was built to dominate a battlefield. Some were designed to wait, climb, track, and intercept, whether over the icy skies of Alaska or the humid jungles of Southeast Asia. The Convair F-102 Delta Dagger was America's first true missile age interceptor. A Delta Wing jet that marked a shift from gunfighting to radar and rockets, from instinct to systems. It had a troubled start its first flight nearly ended the program, but with a redesigned fuselage and a new way of thinking, the F-102 became the backbone of continental air defense and a quiet workhorse in conflicts overseas. This is Chapter 3 in the story of the Century Series. This is the Delta Dagger. By the time the F-100 Super Sabre was screaming through the skies at supersonic speeds, the US Air Force was already thinking differently about the next threat and how to stop it. This wasn't about dogfighting, it wasn't about dropping bombs. The next Century Series fighter wouldn't be designed to attack, it would be built to intercept. Enter the F-102 Delta Dagger, an aircraft developed not for air superiority but for air defense. Its mission, intercept incoming Soviet bombers before they could reach American cities. And to do that, it needed to be fast, high-flying, radar equipped, and missile armed. All in a single package. The Delta Dagger was the first US interceptor built from the ground up or on guided missiles. It wasn't a gunfighter, it was a flying missile platform designed to detect, track, and destroy enemy aircraft at long range, day or night in any weather. Convair, known for bold Delta Wing designs, pitched a sleek, futuristic concept powered by the Pratt & Whitney J57 turbojet engines and equipped with the revolutionary Hughes MG-10 fire control system. But when the first prototype, the YF-102, flew in 1953, it hit a wall, literally and figuratively. It couldn't break the sound barrier. It was underpowered, too draggy, and dangerously close to being cancelled. Then came a last minute save. A redesign based on NACA's new area rule aerodynamic principle. The fuselage was reshaped into a narrower coke bottle profile creating the YF-102A. With that change, everything clicked. The aircraft went supersonic, stabilizing in flight and becoming the foundation of what would become the most widely deployed interceptor in Air Defense Command. If the F-100 Super Sabre was all about speed and power, the F-102 Delta Dagger was about precision and purpose. The Delta Dagger was the first operational aircraft built with the Delta Wing configuration, a sharp, triangular design that gave it excellent supersonic performance, high speed stability, and a large internal volume for fuel and weapons. It was also the first fighter to fully integrate missile-based air combat doctrine into its design from the ground up. At the core of the F-102's offensive capabilities was the Hughes MG-10 fire control system. This wasn't just a radar, it was an early attempt at computerized combat. The MG-10 could detect and track incoming bombers, calculate intercept vectors, and even suggest when to fire. The pilot's job wasn't to outmaneuver the enemy, it was to follow the system's lead and press the trigger at the right time. And when that trigger was pulled, the Delta Dagger unleashed its unique arsenal. Instead of external hardpoints, the F-102 carried its weapons internally, housed in a rotating weapons bay. Inside were a mix of guided and unguided munitions, including six AIM-4 Falcon missiles, the Air Force's first operational air-to-air -air guided missiles, or alternatively up to 24 2.75-inch folding fin aerial rockets for short-range saturation attacks. In some configurations, the F-102 was equipped 
with a nuclear-tipped Air 2 Genie rocket, a blunt force weapon intended to obliterate enemy bomber formations with one detonation. Power came from a single Pratt & Whitney J57 P23 turbojet, giving the F-102 a top speed of around Mach 1.2. The cockpit layout was spartan by modern standards, but cutting edge at the time. Analog radar scopes, targeting indicators, and weapon switches gave the pilot total control over interception. It was also one of the earliest fighters to incorporate air data computers for real-time flight performance adjustments. The F-102's final shape with its narrow waisted fuselage and blended delta wing was as much a result of aerodynamic science as military necessity. Without the aerial rule, it never would have broken the sound barrier. It was an interceptor in the truest sense. No frills, no bombs, no dogfights. Just a fast, high-flying guardian waiting to meet the enemy head on. When the prototype YF-102 took to the skies for the first time on October 24, 1953, optimism ran high. Piloted by Richard L. Johnson, Congress chief test pilot, the jet lifted off from Edwards Air Force Base with all the promise of a next generation interceptor. But that optimism quickly gave away to disappointment. As mentioned before, the prototype struggled in its first flight. It was unstable at high speeds, and most critically, it failed to break the sound barrier in level flight, something that was supposed to be a baseline capability for any aircraft entering Air Defense Command service in the 1950s. Wind tunnel data and test results confirmed a harsh reality. The aircraft was simply producing too much drag. The problem lay in the fuselage design. Though sleek by early jet standards, the body of the YF-102 lacked the aerodynamic finesse needed for transonic and supersonic flight. Engineers identified the culprit, a poor understanding of transonic drag rise and how to manage it. And that's when a groundbreaking aerodynamic theory entered the picture, area ruling. Area ruling, a concept developed by Richard Whitcomb at NACA, the predecessor to NASA, proposed for an aircraft to pass through the transonic regime efficiently, the cross-sectional area of the aircraft needed to change smoothly from nose to tail. This meant that around the wings, which naturally added frontal area, the fuselage needed to narrow or waist in to compensate. Visually, it gave aircraft a coke bottle or wasp waist shape. Convair's engineers quickly adapted the concept and the result was a radical redesigned version of the jet, the YF-102A. With the redesigned fuselage, refined engine inlets, and improved aerodynamics, the YF-102A proved what the original couldn't. Supersonic performance was now within reach. The new version first flew in December 1954, and this time it smashed through Mach 1.2 in level flight, a night and day difference. This redesign essentially saved the entire F-102 program. Had Convair failed to implement the fix, the Air Force likely would have abandoned the project entirely. Instead, the YF-102A formed the blueprint for the F-102A production model which incorporated the same aerodynamic improvements and updated systems. The Air Force quickly greenlit full production, and starting in 1955, Convair began delivering the refined F-102A to Air Defense Command. Over the next years, more than 1,000 Delta Daggers were produced. Though initially envisioned as a stepping stone to more advanced interceptors, the F-102 became the core of America's air defense strategy through the late 50s and into the 60s. Still, there was growing pains. Early production models dealt with engine flameouts, weapons bay issues, and limited reliability of the radar-guided Hughes MG-10 fire control system. Test pilots reported that the aircraft was sensitive to control inputs at high speeds and could become unstable at extreme altitudes, yet the Air Force and Convair continued to refine the platform. By the end of testing, the F-102 had evolved into a credible supersonic interceptor and for a time, it represented the best line of defense the United States had against a high-altitude Soviet bomber attack. The jet that couldn't even reach Mach 1 had been reborn, and it was ready for war, if war ever came. The F-102 Delta Dagger wasn't just a one-off design. Over time, it evolved into several key variants, each with a unique role. Some trained pilots, others flew without one at all, and one even became something new entirely. 
the F-102A was the main version, the one most people picture when they hear Delta Dagger. Over 875 of these aircraft were built. Flying a Delta Wing fighter wasn't easy, especially for new pilots, so Convert built a two-seat trainer version, the TF-102A. It featured a wider canopy with side-by-side -side seating, a slightly stretched fuselage, and no combat systems. What it lacked in weapons, it made up for in training value, helping pilots safely learn the Dagger's flight characteristics before moving to frontline squadrons. More than 100 were built, and they were used across the US and overseas. When the F-102's interceptor days were over, many were converted into QF-102A target drones. These remotely flown aircraft were used for missile tests and air-to-air -air training, helping develop and refine weapons like the AIM-7 Sparrow and AIM-9 Sidewinder. These drones extended the Dagger's service life well into the 80s. During the 60s and 70s, some surplus F-102s were transferred to US allies under military aid programs. Both Greece and Turkey received small fleets of the Delta Dagger, using them primarily for air defense. These aircraft were similar to the late model US F-102As and were made in service into the early 80s. Finally, there was the F-102B, or at least that's what it was called at first. Originally meant to be a refined version of the Delta Dagger, the F-102B was so extensively redesigned that it became a new aircraft entirely, the F-106 Delta Dart. With better engines, updated systems, and improved performance, it carried the torch of the Century Series interceptors into the next decade. While the F-102 was in a dogfighter or headline maker, it became one of the most widespread and relied upon interceptors of the Cold War era. In a world braced for a Soviet bomber strike at any moment, the Delta Dagger was one of the first lines of defense and it stayed on that line for nearly two decades. From the late 50s onward, the F-102A was deployed across Air Defense Command bases in the continental United States, stationed at strategic locations across the northern US and Alaska. F-102s were part of a complex web of radar stations, ground controllers, and airborne interceptors, all poised to respond within minutes to an incursion from Soviet bombers. Crews often stood at 24 hours alert, sitting in cockpits or ready rooms just minutes from the runway. It was a tense, but mostly quiet role, one built on readiness, not combat. During the 60s, the F-102 also participated in Operation Sky Shield, a series of massive air defense exercises that simulated a full-scale Soviet air attack on North America. Now, the F-102 wasn't just a homeland defender. It also served with the United States Air Forces in Europe and the Pacific Air Forces. Units were deployed to West Germany, the UK, South Korea, Okinawa, and Taiwan, often stationed within striking distance of Warsaw Pact airspace or the Chinese mainland. In Europe, the F-102s provided a nuclear tip deterrent, with interceptors loaded with Air-2 Genie rockets capable of taking out entire bomber formations in a single blast. These deployments were both practical and symbolic, a message to US allies and adversaries that the skies were being watched. Though never intended for combat over jungles and rice paddies, the F-102 Delta Dagger found itself deployed to Southeast Asia by the early 60s. Starting in 1962, Delta Daggers were stationed at Da Nang and Tan Song Nu air bases where they flew patrols to intercept North Vietnamese MiGs and protect American strike aircraft. They also escorted B-52s during Operation Arc Light, scanning the skies for threats during the massive bombing runs. While most of their missions were uneventful, the F-102 did enter the fight and, in at least one instance, it didn't come home. In February 1968, an F-102 was shot down by a North Vietnamese MiG-21, marking one of the few direct air-to-air -air engagements involving the Delta Dagger. It was a stark reminder that this interceptor, designed for high altitude Soviet bombers, was now operating in a very different kind of war. The F-102's Delta Wing design, so effective at altitude, struggled in the hot, humid, low-level environment of Vietnam. Maneuverability suffered and radar performance degraded in the thick tropical atmosphere. By 1968, most F-102's were withdrawn from Vietnam, replaced by more agile and multi-role platforms better suited to the region's demands. 
Still, the early presence helped secure the airspace, a quiet but important role in a conflict that never stayed quiet for long. Back home, the F-102 remained a workhorse for Air Defense Command through the early 1970s, gradually replaced by the F-106 Delta Dart and F-4 Phantoms, the last operational F-102A left frontline service in 1976, but its career didn't end there. As mentioned before, a number of airframes were converted into unmanned target drones. Many were expended in live fire tests, but a few survive today as museum pieces or gate guards. Quiet reminders of an aircraft that spent most of its career on high alert, hoping to never fire a shot. Thank you so much for watching, and if you've made it all the way to the end, I really appreciate you sticking around. I also want to take a moment to say a huge thank you for the support in the last video, and to welcome all the new faces here. We just passed a thousand subscribers, and I honestly couldn't be happier. This channel started as just an idea, and seeing it grow like this means a lot, so thank you. Thank you for watching, for sharing, and for helping me turn this channel into something real. Anyways, I'll see you on the next one.